Timing is everything. And that comes down to the rhythm that you're using in your speech. Are you talking too fast? Are you going like this? You're making everybody nervous in the room. Are you, <laughs> yeah. or are you going really slow and you're talking like a turtle and nobody's listening because they have tuned you out? Welcome to Audio Branding, the hidden gem of marketing. Sound plays a more important role in human behavior and our decision-making than you may realize. In this podcast, I'll help you understand the art and science of sound so you can better influence others in business and your life. I'm your host, Jody Krangle. Let's delve a little deeper. This is part two of my interview with Julia Langley. As we're speaking about tone, I wanted to sort of ask you, like, do you have um, set ideas of what certain tones indicate in a speaking voice? Like are, if you hear someone speaking and they're using tones in certain ways, like do you associate certain things with certain tones, like certain emotions, I guess, with certain tones? Absolutely. Um, a lower tone is considered more authoritative. Okay. That's why if you do have that high, you know, voice and you want to be a trial attorney, (laughs) we have to work on it. Yeah. You know, (laughs) <laughs> and trial attorneys perform every day. Don't think that just because you're not singing on stage that you're not performing. Most of us have to perform every single day of our lives. So um, it's important to understand what that tone says. And and you might not be, you might talk like this. And you might be the strongest, baddest person around and talk <laughs> like this, but no one's going to believe you. Uh-huh. <laughs> If you speak in a timid voice Mm -hmm. and then the projection is very important as well. I mean, the projection gives a sense of strength in your voice. It also is clarity. So people can understand that you're there and you mean business, not necessarily in a bad way, but that uh, it garners respect as opposed to not saying your words and speaking like this and and making your sound real breathy. Some people have a lot of breath in their sound. So these singing techniques that I teach can also help get rid of that breathiness and make you sound stronger. It's just having all the elements working together, your breath, your diaphragm, uh, your vocal cords, knowing where to put sounds in your face make a huge difference in what we're talking about, in the lowness or the highness, the softness or the loudness. And then we, in music, we actually call this dynamics in a voice. Sure. The changes in your voice. Yeah. Very important. And I'm sure there are times when being softer is actually, uh, you know, preferable. <laughs> but I wanted to... Absolutely. Yeah, I wanted to sort of touch on that a little bit because I, I'm curious what you might give people as advice for improving their voice on a podcast. Well, I think clarity is one of the most important things. You have the the, the most clarity in your voice. <laughs> and I and it's beautiful to it's a voice that I could just listen to all day long, by the way. <laughs> well, thank you. you. <laughs> it's true. It's so true. It's very calming. Mm-hmm. You 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 are you're so soothing, but yet it's clear at the same time. And so I'm just using you as an example, <laughs> Jody, but um that's I, people respond to that. They respond to that. And, and um, oh, and you, uh, and the question, see, here we go. I'm getting off on a tangent. <laughs> it's okay. Qu- yeah. Remind me what I'm trying to answer. <laughs> see, I, I was not actively That's listening. Okay. Right uh, the question was how can someone improve their voice on a podcast, which I guess is oh, different. On a podcast. Yeah. It's different from singing. It's different from speaking publicly. Although these days, if people are doing a lot of virtual speaking, it might be closer to that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Well, and it's also like recording. Um, It's very different singing a live show as as opposed to being in recording studio. So it's very similar to recording. So the projection is not needed as much. you, the, the softness and the tone that you're speaking about is is much nicer in a recording than someone that's being loud and overpowering mm-hmm. because that would read as aggressive and it would also read, sometimes it reads as a know-it-all, you, you know, yeah. and, and that may not be who you are at all, but this is why sometimes they say perception is everything. Yeah. I mean, it's really not who you are, but it's how you're coming across to others. So I think 
two of the most important things in a podcast would be the softness of the tone, the relatability in your tone, as well as the clarity in your speech. And the clarity will come from the way you say your words. As a Southerner, I'm from the Southern United States. I grew up in Alabama and I have this Southern accent. (laughs) And we draw our words out and they're all like one. I have some friends in Alabama. I I love the accent. I think it's beautiful, but you know, I, yeah. Thank you. (laughs) But we have some, we have some really bad habits that we run. We, everything's a run on sentence in Alabama. We don't stop and start our words yeah. correctly and you know uh, and I've had to learn and I always said the word um don't instead of doesn't you know and I had to learn <laughs> just because of where I was from uh-huh. and hearing it all the time sure. um I had to change some things in my own speech uh to come across you know on stage and and virtually as well so we all have our battles that we have to face and things that we have to change you know to and one of the best ways to do it is to watch yourself watch yourself on camera uh go live a lot i i go live a good bit um i record myself speaking and listen to it back and you know for a long time i would cringe every single time i did it <laughs> you i guess get you get used to that. it yeah. Yeah, you do. And and you make the improvements. When you when you're watching yourself, it forces you to make the improvements that you need to make, you know, in your own voice. And and if you're at a loss, then that's when a vocal teacher can come in come in handy because oftentimes other people can see things that you can't see in yourself. Yeah. And sometimes we just don't know what we don't know. <laughs> There's oh. no way to improve unless someone gives you the tools to do that. You know, then otherwise you're just continuing with bad habits. <laughs> no, it's so true. Absolutely. You're, you're absolutely right. And, 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 and material is another thing I want to uh, sort of address. And I guess this applies a little more to singers, but not necessarily um, the things that you're speaking on have to identify with who you, you, you have to be able to identify with them as, as an individual as well. S- singers are the same. Um, it's, I find that one of the biggest challenges singers face is song choices for themselves. Everything that you say and do is not going to be for you. And you have to come to terms with, you know, you might want to be a rock star, but you might sound like an opera singer. It ain't going to work, you know? It's like, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, you, yeah. you have to be okay with who you aren't as well mm-hmm. as being okay with who you are. And then again, going back to really finding those strengths and playing and playing those up. Totally. I have to do that in voiceover every day. <laughs> I'm given auditions for a whole bunch of things that I might try, but uh, it's very unlikely I'll be hired for. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and you, and you know, you, and your speech is beautiful. I mean, you have beautiful speech and still. Well, but if you want like a, if you want like a, an urban millennial sound, exactly. you don't want me. No, you, <laughs> you know, like, Exa- exactly. I, I know. <laughs> exactly. I, you know, you want a New Yorker. I, I, I can yeah. do accents, but uh, there was a. Just but they'd that... rather get the real thing. Right. right. You know, that's <laughs> so, right. Yeah. There's still this tinge of Alabama in my voice, no matter how. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's there. But there's so much opened up all over the world that now that they can just find the person who very specifically fits that, you know, that particular voice they're looking for. So, like, why try to be something you aren't? (laughs) Uh, You know what? You're going to be found out anyway. And that's what I always say. Don't, you know, work with what, who you are and what you have. But you, but again, you have to be okay. And I went through this phase with my singing too, where I wanted to be a coloratura soprano and everything I picked, which for those who may not know, coloratura is like Sarah Brightman that, sang Phantom of the Opera. Yeah. That that's a coloratura and she sings off the end of the piano. Well, I'm not. I'm a mezzo <laughs> I'm a mezzo soprano. It took me a little mm-hmm. while to be, be okay with not being the other. And um it's it's being okay with yourself and those things that you're not so great at. But um again, then you learn what you are good at and then the sky's the limit. You really punch through that barrier and and soar with it. Speak again, speaking as well as singing. It sure it, there's just so much that's parallel, you know, with with the two. Yes, 
they are different. Singing requires actually a, a little more breast support than speaking does, but it, it still doesn't matter. Have you ever heard um, someone, you know, do a conference and then they lose their voice? Oh, yeah. Yeah, all the time. Mm -hmm. That's a technique problem. Nine times out of 10, it's technique. And I see it all the time with singers. They go through tech week, putting up a show on stage, 14 hour rehearsal days, very physical, not sleeping at all. And guess what happens opening night? Yeah. <laughs> they don't have There's a voice. nothing left. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's... Because they're using poor technique mm -hmm. and they're not, of course, taking care of themselves too. But, um, but, but really technique is the issue. Um, and I'm big, big, big on technique. I, I think 1,500 shows without missing one one time. Wow. That, that was a lot. Yeah. And the only way I did it is because my technique is strong. And I really, really focus on that. Are you looking for ways to improve your company's or podcast's impact? You'd be surprised how powerful the use of an intentional audio branding strategy can be. Want to know more? I have a free downloadable PDF that gives you my five tips for implementing an intentional audio strategy at voiceoversandvocals.com slash audio dash branding dash strategy. That location does ask to put you on a mailing list just to send you updates on when the new podcasts come out. But if you really don't want to give your email out, I understand. Just contact me directly. My email is all over my website and I'll make sure you get that PDF without needing to sign up anywhere. If you do sign up, though, you also get access to a resources section called The Studio, where I have videos, white papers and PDFs, discounts from my guests, and snippets of audio from my guests that no one else gets to hear. So maybe it's worth your while. Totally up to you. And of course, if you're looking for voiceovers, you can get in touch with me about that, too. Now, back to the podcast. So does technique help people become more uh, recognizable to, to stand out? Is that something that yes. can help a voice do that? Absolutely. You have just hit on one of the most important things, I think, um, as a singer, as a speaker, for sure, both, uh, is how, how do you stand out? And it's learning that technique. Um, Somebody, somebody said to me, one of my students, and she has a, a, a very similar sounding voice to what I have. They're like, it's like watching you up there. <laughs> they told me that. I started yeah. laughing. I'm like, oh, no, because you don't want to be like anybody else. You want to be your own person. But she does things differently for me. But the, the point I'm trying to make is you start to as I said, just go, just do it. And you start to learn what you're not good at, what you are good at. Then you start to find who you really are. As you start to develop things like phrasing, how you say sentences, mm -hmm. um, that this little Southern accent that comes through every now and then, or the New York accent that comes through every now and then, these are all part of your persona and part of the things that people detect when that they're when they're listening to you. This is one of the most important things if you have aspirations of going a step beyond just doing it for fun. If you really want to be a high level professional speaker or a professional singer as well, people need to identify you like that. And these are the things that make the difference. The tone of your voice the phrasing, the way you say sentences, where you breathe in those sentences are very important. And here is one more thing that I think is um, a really, really big deal is rhythm. And I, people, rhythm, yes, because rhythm is what makes the connection with others. Mm -hmm. You ever hear somebody tapping on something and then <laughs> yeah. other people start snapping? It's a connection. It is an they have proven this, that it's something in your brain that automatically connects with that. Sure. So for comedians, for speakers, timing is everything. And that comes down to the rhythm that you're using in your speech. Are you talking too fast? Are you going like this? You're making everybody nervous in the room. Are you, <laughs> yeah. are you going really slow and you're talking like a turtle and nobody's listening because they have tuned you out? Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> So that's all part of your signature. 
It's interesting, though, because you talk about this signature, and as you're talking about this, I'm like, well, okay, so that's their audio brand. <laughs> yes! I mean, it really is. It really is. <laughs> that is so, that's why I'm so, I was so interested when we first met and what you do, because I believe in audio branding 100% percent. And you know, I in the in the music world, I'm I've had people talk about people who are famous, but their careers weren't going to last very long because they and as good a singer as they were, they had no identifying characteristics in their voice. Yes. And it's true. It's so true. And then you hear some pop singers who say their names in their songs. <laughs> and they do it so you know who they are. Because yeah. otherwise, you wouldn't know who they were. Yep. Because again, yep. no identifying characteristics in their voice. They don't stand out. Yeah. So it's very, yes, this audio branding is extremely important. Yeah. And that can be done through speech or through song or a combination of the two. Yeah, or both. Yeah, I love or it. Or both. And yeah. in the case of um, podcasters, I always get the, the feeling that, um, and I've said this in, in talks before, if someone has a certain phrase that they say all the time or that they end their podcast with, then people start to expect that they're going to say that on every podcast and then they are known as the person who says that, you know? Absolutely. And that's an audio brand, you know? So that's a way that, a podcaster could do that really simply and cheaply too. Like it doesn't even have to have anything to do with the music you have on your intro or outro or it's just you. <laughs> that is, it's so true. And, and, um, and people, they come to expect it and they actually love it because it becomes, it, it inspires them. Yeah. It's something that is inspirational for them. It's familiar. It's familiar and it's, it's recognizable and memorable. Yes. And, Really, we get the most out of things when things are repeated. <laughs> we memorize things inadvertently as they're repeated because it's consistent. So, that's yeah, exactly it's... that. Is, and that's something that has been a learning experience for me as I've moved online is that they, people like the they, they they're geared to be repetitive like that. And they like that feeling. It's a feeling of comfort for them. Yeah. And uh, so I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I, I think that audio, I, I, when I first learned about audio branding, I, you know, I immediately think of television shows sure. who have a sound yeah. at the beginning of the show. I can be in the other room and I know exactly what show's coming on television. I don't even have to hear anything. It's really interesting um, and and I, I only mention this because the, the television show thing got me thinking about this as well, that there are theme songs that television shows have. And then as they progress through parts of the, you know, the television show that are more dramatic or whatever, you'll still hear the same notes of the intro. They're, they're in there, but they've reworked it so it's in a minor key or something like that. Like it's, you know, but it's it's their audio brand sprinkled throughout the entire show. Um, I just started watching really old uh, episodes of JAG. Because <laughs> I know, I don't know. Well, I love NCIS. This is so weird. That, I, that's like, I'm Canadian. I don't really, I have no ties to the military at all, but I love NCIS. <laughs> that's so funny. I, it's a great and, show. I watch it, it too. It is a great show. <laughs> but I wanted to watch JAG because I wanted to see how they intermeshed because I know in the later years, they, they both intertwined. They, yeah. they were both having guest appearances on each other's shows. So I started in like 1995, which is the first episode of JAG. And then it ends, I think, in 2005. And and I'm like on the sixth season or something now. And I am noticing this audio brand because it's their intro song sprinkled throughout the entire episode used in various different ways to denote various different emotions and parts of the dramatic storyline. But it's all that one that one theme song. That's right. And they've stuck with it for the whole you know, and I have to tell you, just to expand upon that a little bit, um, Broadway writers use the same formula. It's the same formula. Yeah. If you go, let's use uh, Into the Woods. That was a movie uh, a couple of years, a few years back, and a great 
a great musical. It has that same sound all the way through it. And like you're saying, it's a different variation of the sound, but you know that it is done. It's a da 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 um, yeah, going to the movies and the theater with us would be a whole experience for people, wouldn't it? <laughs> totally, totally. Well, movies have the same thing, right? They have a theme song, you know. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, in um, uh, the Bond films, all of the Bond films. I mean, they have that one. Raised sixth. You know, it's a raised sixth is what it is. <laughs> I love that. Intervals. Okay. I can yeah. tell you musically what it is, but it's in every song. It's yeah. always there. It's a formula that they use and it's in every song. That's how, because people know it like that. If you turn it's on, comforting. that's right. They know. It. Oh, James yeah. Bond. You know, you know it automatically because it has yeah. a distinctive sound to it. And, um, so it, so it doesn't just apply to TV shows, though, as we've said. It also applies to individuals, to people who want to develop um, that nice little package for their own sound sure. and for their own shows or their own um, performance, their own speaking um, th that th they're doing live or, or virtually, either one. I, I want to get us into a little bit of a discussion and I hate to do this at the end of the episode, but I wanted to bring us to the topic of PTSD because this was because it, it is something that's wired into our brains in regards to sound. And as we're talking about audio branding and we're talking about TV shows that have, you know, uh, musical themes that go through them. There is a component of this that can work against us, unfortunately. Yes. And and I sort of wanted to go into how that's affected you. And I know that you are speaking out about this a lot. So I wanted to sort of get your perspective on how that's changed your life and 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 what it is, really. Oh, absolutely. Um, after the accident, you know, I <clears throat> I watched the car run me down. Actually, it was a good f five or six seconds. I saw it coming and I got up close and personal with the grill of this car. And um, I was diagnosed with severe PTSD and it, you know, PTSD didn't start right away, although I it usually starts a few months after you know, anywhere it can, it can start anywhere up to years after to tell you the truth. But mine started about four to six months after my accident, I started noticing some uh, problems that I was having. And one of the problems that I have is a startle reflex, as you're saying. So it has made it um, difficult for me in the sense that I cannot be in a room with really loud noises anymore. Mm -hmm. And it might be, again, we talked about the way I filter sound. I'm listening to all of these things. So, no, so sounds are magnified for me anyway, as I filter them. And now, um, let's say I'm in a room with a band playing and the band is really loud. Um, I, I can't, I can't stay in there. If the loud, if the noise is unexpected, I have my fight or flight kicks in and I, I have panic attacks now. So the, the, the startle from the sound is really, really bad. And, um, what, what happens is actually PTSD actually is a change in the brain and people don't realize that the amygdala in your brain actually gets larger in PTSD. The hippocampus becomes really? smaller and the amygdala uh -huh. gets larger. So, um, your ability to filter those sounds and know that you're safe is actually limited in the amygdala, which triggers that fight or flight in your body is larger. And that is a scientific, that's something that they've proven. So it's not just, <laughs> it's not just a feeling. It's not just psychological. It's actually a physical change in the body. So um, your ability to control it becomes less. So, you know, like I know that I'm safe if someone's banging on I don't know, a pan or throwing pans and the, the, I know that I'm safe, but I, I can't control that 
need to to get out of the get out of the way of danger. I I struggle with this still, um, along with other symptoms with the panic attacks and and nightmares and things like that. So it has definitely had an impact on just life in general, my well being and and my approach. The thing about PTSD, though, is that you have to learn how to manage it. And it, basically, you have it for the rest of your life. And you, yeah. and you learn how to deal with it. Um, and music is one way that you can deal with PTSD. It um, It is calming. It's relaxing. Singing gets those endorphins going. Uh, it calms the nervous system down. It lowers your, um, your cortisol levels, which is someone with PTSD that, that all of these things are going on inside their body. And so, you know, you just learn these techniques to help, help control it. I know that we're all dealing with a lot of stuff these days, so I particularly wanted to acknowledge those that have taken the time to leave honest reviews of this podcast. Thrive After 55 writes, This is a gem of a podcast. Jody is not only an accomplished talent in voiceover and singing, but can now add gracious and welcoming podcast host. Her style of interviewing truly allows room for her guests to shine with interesting and intriguing information. This is a great add to your podcast listening. Thank you, Thrive, for your very kind review. And now back to the show. Yeah, I was going to ask you what techniques you had to to lessen the effects. Yeah, yeah. most of the time, if I have that uh, that fear that the, the feeling of panic or that fear of flight, I have to just take myself and set myself down for a few minutes and breathe. I use breathing exercises just because, um, as a singer. I know how valuable these breathing exercises really are when done correctly. Sure. So it, it's, it's a breathing exercise and then I can just put my heads, I, I sing a lot or I'll put my headphones on and listen, but listening to music does not have the same effect on your body that singing has on. And that is, that's a scientific fact as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. It does not get the endorphins going as much as actually e executing the sounds from within. So, um, singing is one of the best things for that. Um, as far as stress goes, relieving stress. Yeah. So that's what I do. Those are the two biggest things that I do. That's great. Do you have any online resources that you particularly go to? Or uh, I'm just curious, you don't have to answer that now. Maybe if you have a thought, you can always uh, send that stuff to me later, but I'd, I'd love to give some, give people some resources if they're Interesting. Yes, absolutely. Let me let me send those to you. I'll send a couple of um, resources on PTSD. And I also sure. have um, a, a, a file of the exercises that we talked about earlier. And I can send that to you as a, you know, people can put up and remind themselves. Um, that would be great. Let sure. me see, resources. I have um, a, a resource called the studio that I give people who are subscribe to the email list that lets them know when these episodes come out. Okay. Uh, and it's a, it's just a resource that people go in for snippets from the interviews that no one else is hearing, PDFs of books that people have given me to, you know, give these people, and videos that have um, uh, vocal exercises, actually. I have uh, two of those up right now. Um, if you have a, a video that you've made that has anything like that, that would be awesome. Anything that you feel like um, the people who would listen to this podcast would find useful. You're Absolutely. more than welcome to to okay. send my way and I can put in that location for them to find. <laughs> okay. No, that's wonderful. Yes. I, I think that that's terrific. Uh, um, just materials that people can take and use on their own. And um, yeah, definitely. I, and, and definitely on the PTSD, because this is something that um, I'm very, uh, I'm very passionate about. I, I, I have spoken with a fellow out of Nashville who does um, a thing on music healing the healing effects of music and it there's so many things that music does for us that singing does for us it it, it boosting the immune system um 
improves concentration and memory. I mean, they've proven this in Alzheimer patients. As I said before, it releases endorphins. It gives us calm under stress. These are just a few of the things that um, that singing and music are good for, and, and that's a great resource to have. And to know, you know, if you have a panic attack or, or you're having a, a moments of depression or, you know, if you're aging and you're forgetful, music Music is good for all of those things. And uh, so. Yeah, it's wonderful to know. I like to share that. Yeah. And it's good to know that there's something you could do to help yourself. Right. You know? Like that's, that's always uh, something that can maybe help with a little depression. <laughs> well, it, it's so true, you know, and as I told you, um, music affects 12 diff- separate parts of our, our brain, like thinking, decision making and the frontal lobe music. It, it, so when we sing. All of these different parts light up. So we're building neurons as we're singing. And it, it it's really amazing. And the studies have really shown in young kids, too, how it completely changes their life as they age. And if you're given music at an early age, you have that music for the rest of your life. And it shows like in Alzheimer patients, they might not even remember what they had for lunch or even that they ate lunch, but they can remember a song that they played on the piano when they were 10 years old, because it goes into that long-term memory. Yeah. It's pretty so, amazing. And I mean, I could go, this is a whole topic in itself and I won't, <laughs> oh, I yeah. won't, I yeah. won't go on and on, but we were talking about, uh, the PTSD and how important it is that, um, that we include music in the healing process because it is a gift. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I think that's a, a really good thought to, to have in mind. Yeah. Um, I wanted to uh, sort of wind down here a little bit, but I wanted to ask you what you're working on now. Well, I am actually doing an online course that people can go in and purchase. Um, I have been in the process of building my website, so it's not up and functional quite yet. Um, Okay, by the time this comes out, it may be. I'm hoping that it will be. I do. It's julialangley.net, but if you go to that right now, it's it's not functional yet, but it will be soon. Um, I have that. And then the next thing for me is to get the online course up and running. Running. It will have everything f- that I've talked about today, uh, techniques, tone, breath support, using our muscles, using our diaphragm, visual singing, um, diction, huge, you know, how to keep from being flat and, uh, flat and sharp, how not to lose your voice, how to hit mm-hmm. high notes, how to find your confidence speaking in front of a crowd, how to get over stage fright, all these different kinds That's of things. That's a biggie. <laughs> it is. Yeah. How to, yeah. Over, how to overcome these things that you know are, are, are problems. Uh, you know, again, like how not to u- lose your voice when you're speaking for two days straight. Yeah. Those are examples. And that's the thing that uh, I am focused on right now. I love that. Yeah. Okay. So the people, uh, uh, if they want to get in touch with you, they can go to julialangley.net. Is that? They can. As soon as that, again, we're in the process of making that functional. The best way to reach me right now is I am on Facebook at Julia Langley. And it is, they can just go to that page. We can connect like that. Feel free to send me a message through Messenger. Just let me know that you saw this podcast. And um, I'd love to connect with you that way. I do, um, that is really like a business page for me. So I put up all of the things that are going on there. And then as other resources come available in the next few months, which they are, I have a YouTube channel that I'm really going to boost very soon Great. Um, along with my website. So um, I'm in this process. I'm in this process <laughs> of, of, I wish it was all ready today, but. Um, oh, it's fine. It's one fine. thing yeah. at a time, you know, one yeah. thing at a time. <laughs> By the time this comes out, people will be able to check it all out and get your course and, and connect with you on Facebook and all of that good stuff. So Wonderful. I think it'll be fine. <laughs> okay, Judy. Yeah, that's Great. Thank you so much. This it's, has been really great. I've yeah. learned a ton too, so oh, I really appreciate it. <laughs> well, I love it, I, and I love talking to you as always. Uh, like the first time we met, it just it's just so comfortable speaking with you. So, thank you <laughs> for glad. having me on here. Thanks. Well, that's the end of this episode. 
Thanks for listening. And if you like what you heard, why not tell a friend about this podcast? It's available in all the usual locations. Until next time.